normal cars have to be a blend of economy, longevity, practicality, performance and looks. But with a supercar only two things matter, power and style. It doesn't matter if you can't fit inside, or if they do four miles to the gallon, or if the boot looks like a hamster cage, only smaller. They're dream cars, so it doesn't matter if they cost a million quid, or if no insurance company will go near them with a barge pole. All they need to do is burn rubber and have good enough looks to snap knicker elastic at 50 paces. Take the new McLaren F1, for instance. Now, it has seating for three and even some luggage space underneath here. But that doesn't matter. What does matter is that it's one of the wildest-looking cars ever made, that it costs a million dollars, and that it has a 627-horsepower, 6.1-litre engine. Now, they say it's the fastest car in the world, but at the time of recording this, there's been no independent test. So, officially, the fastest car in the world is still the Jaguar XJ220. For most people, the biggest investment of their lives is in the bricks and mortar of their own home. Buying a car is a long way back in second place. But even if you've lived in a house as grand as this, there is one car that can match the value of your home. The Jaguar XJ220. There's been talk recently about some buyers trying to sell their deposits for the Jaguar because the bottom's fallen out of the supercar market. So if you put down your 50,000 a few years back simply to cash in on a quick profit, you're going to be disappointed. But if you bought your XJ220 for the ultimate in driving pleasure, you just can't lose. We've all heard the expression that something feels like a million dollars. Well, this is a million dollars and it feels great. The driving position is excellent with seat, steering and pedals all in line ahead. There's plenty of luxurious leather all around you and enough instruments and controls to keep a Concorde captain happy. There's plenty of headroom for anyone up to about six foot three tall, which means that only people like Jeremy Clarkson can't fit in. Shame. Now, the 220 doesn't just give pleasure from the inside. It's a delight to look at, even at a standstill. It really is one of the most beautiful cars ever created. And it carries forward those classic Jaguar lines from the 50s and 60s. Unfortunately, underneath the skin, there's precious little room for practical things like luggage. Under the front, it's all fans and radiators. In the middle, it's all engine and gearbox. And in the rear, no room for my golf clubs. Now, the best way to understand why there is so little room is to see how the 220 is put together in the factory. The cars are assembled in Jaguar Sport's new facility in Bloxham near Banbury. The bodies, fully built and painted at Abbey Panels in Coventry, are made of aluminium honeycomb. The engines are built by Tom Walkinshaw Racing at Kidlington. With the gearbox and double wishbone rear suspension, they hang from an aluminium subframe that's offered up to the underside of the body. It's encased in a rear under tray, moulded to form Venturi tunnels designed for optimum downforce. That's where the luggage space goes. The huge rear tyres cost £890 each and there's no room for a spare. So you have to rely on a canister of mousse to get you home if you have a puncture.
Maneuvering the car, you're very aware of its seven foot three inch width, but out on the road, you get used to it in no time. Visibility all round is generally very good, but I didn't like the wipers and reflections intruding into the view through the windscreen. But all this is soon forgotten. Once you open the throttle and the twin turbo quad cam 24 valve 3.5 litre V6 provides you with over 540 horsepower. Like many people, I'm disappointed that the original V12 engine has been dropped, but Jaguar found they couldn't get over 500 horsepower from it and meet the ever tighter emission controls. Besides, the V6 is lighter and more economical, even though the turbos rob it of a decent exhaust howl. The car itself is fairly heavy to drive. There's no power assistance for either the steering or the brakes. But the brakes in particular needing a lot of muscle power to slow the 220 down. The suspension is really very good indeed, soaking up the bumps on country lanes with ease. But this car is about speed, and that means getting off the public roads and on to a private test track. The XJ220 is aimed squarely at the Diablo and F40 buyer, so why not go to their home country, Italy, and use Fiat's Nardo test track to answer the simple question, how fast? I was busy at Le Mans that weekend when former Jaguar racer Martin Brundle took time off from his usual Formula One duties to find out. The bank circular track is eight miles round, so there's plenty of room to build up to an impressive 212.3 miles an hour, recorded not only on the very accurate speedo, but also by engine telemetry and radar. The catalysts fitted to the production car's exhaust soak up about 60 horsepower, so the team took them off and Martin went out again. This time, 217.1, equivalent to over 223 miles an hour on a flat, straight road. This is a quick car. I wasn't too concerned about reaching top speeds, but a trip to a racing circuit would give some idea about the car's high-speed performance. Now, the main reason to go out on a racing circuit is to really be able to use this tremendous horsepower. On the road, you find that there's a fair amount of lag when you suddenly demand acceleration in second gear. There's just, whoa, that momentary lag. But of course, when you're using the engine at high revs all the time, most of that lag is gonna disappear and we can really see some high speed motoring. It's also going to be a fair amount of braking around a racetrack like Alton Park with its beautiful country-like turns and twists. Down to the hairpin with second gear. Gradual application of the throttle, then this acceleration in second to 90 miles an hour. Third gear takes us right through to 130 almost. And then in fourth gear, we're already up to 140 before we need to break heavily down into this tight chicane. Power. I love it. The first impressions of the handling of the car, it's actually a lot more nimble than the, the weight of the car and the size of the car. Here we're cornering at, what, 100, 110 miles an hour with beautiful poise. Even these slower, tighter corners in second gear, the car turns in well and then accelerates with just a hint of oversteer coming at the end of the corner. All in all, it's been a wonderful experience with the owner of a Jaguar XJ220, even if only for a couple of days. It really is a most beautiful car to drive. But I have to admit that it's more refined racing car than sophisticated road car, and it's only really at home when it's let loose at speed.
The XJ220 was designed solely to be the fastest car in the world, while the Diablo was designed solely to be the biggest head turner. Dynamically, it's a brute. On a twisting, turning country lane, an escort Cosworth would leave it for dead. But when it comes to getting your eyes out on stalks, this is king of the hill. And so was the Countach, and so was the Miura. You can do something for love. You can do something for money. But there's nothing quite so satisfying as doing something out of spite. Were it not for spite, one of the greatest legends in motoring might never have existed. Signor Ferruccio Lamborghini didn't like Enzo Ferrari, and to spite him, he set about making a better car. Now, most people thought he was being a bit of a ninny when he came up with the Miura. They didn't anymore. Now, there'd been mid-engined racing cars before, but this little baby was a first. This was a mid-engined road car. <laughs> what an engine. 3.9 litres, V12, a lot of carburettors. 380 horsepower. Now, all that equates to a top speed of 180 miles an hour if you could keep the front wheels on the ground, and not to 60 in five seconds. In the 1960s... Now, in those days, you could use that sort of power. Driving the Miura today is evocative, nostalgic. Back then, it must have been just damn good fun. But then came the 1970s, complete with loon pants and glam rock, and to complement them perfectly, the Lamborghini Countach. Now remember, in 1971, everyone was driving around in Mark II Cortinas. This was as big a leap forward as the Harrier jump jet was from the horse. its long 19-year life, the Countach kept pace with technological change, evolving from this, the LP400, into this, the anniversary, complete with a 5.2-litre 48-valve V12 and looks that could turn the head of even the most dedicated motoring dunderhead. Now, this is not the nastiest car I've ever driven, because obviously I've been in a Nissan Micra, but it's damn close. It's a bit like driving a washing machine, only the visibility is worse. You can forget all about that letterbox they dare to call a rear window because you can't see anything out of that. There's no rear three-quarter vision and the door mirrors wobble like hell. I'm not joking, Daryl Hannah could be sunbathing topless on the boot and I wouldn't have a clue. But what, I hear you ask, is it like to drive? Well, the answer comes in two parts because on the open road, it's impossible, and around town, it's even more impossible. The problem seems to be that the pipe cleaners which stick out of my torso masquerading as arms and legs are simply not up to the job of turning the steering wheel, or just as importantly, pushing the clutch pedal down. It was, however, not designed as a town car. The boot isn't even big enough for a packet of biscuits. It was designed to go fast, and it does that rather well. So well, in fact, that if you push the loud pedal all the way to the floor, it scares you to death.
Then there's the style, which, let's face it, is more Paul Gascoigne than Edward Fox. If this was food, it would be an ice cream sundae with a sparkler stuck in the top. If it was music, it'd be rock and roll. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad the cantage was made, and I'm glad the world is still capable of such an outrage. I'm glad too I don't own one, but most of all, I'm glad it's now been consigned to the history books. This is why. It's called the Diablo, and it's one of the fastest cars in the world. In Italy, it's been officially clocked at 206 miles an hour. But don't for one moment think I'm going to try that here. What I am going to do is demonstrate just how fast the Diablo accelerates. This is the Castlecombe racetrack in Wiltshire. That is a Golf GTI. And this is the difference between a fast car and a Lamborghini. Well, that was something else. But how did it do it? Well, the Golf's got a 1.8-litre four-cylinder engine. This has a 5.7-litre V12. The Golf develops 112 horsepower. This develops nearly 500. The Golf goes from 0 to 60 in about eight seconds. This does it in four. But then again, the Golf does 30 mpg, and this doesn't. But never mind the performance, the best bit is that unlike the Countach, I can actually fit inside. I can also operate the controls and most important of all, I can see out, which is useful when you're going quickly. The question is, could you really push this thing to its limits? And would every 19-year-old male with a moustache that looks like an earwig kindly stop nodding now, please, because my bet is... You couldn't. It doesn't matter, though, because what we have here is nothing more than a toy. It's just that it's a few rungs further up the ladder from a train set. If you were a very, very good driver, and if you were prepared to concentrate absolutely, the 911 could reward like no other car on the road. But if you lost concentration even for a second, it would fling you into the hedge. The 911 built up a fearsome reputation as a giant killer, but that didn't stop brave, talented and rich men forming queues to buy one. They knew the engine was slung out at the back there, way behind the rear axle, waiting to act like a giant pendulum. But they didn't mind risking making the ultimate sacrifice in pursuit of the ultimate reward. They wanted to try and tame the 911. Three little numbers which could strike as much fear into the heart of mortal man as 666. If this car had a name, it would be Damien. Me, I used to look forward to driving a 911 with the same sort of relish that I looked forward to getting into bed at night with a tarantula. But that was then. This is now. Woohoo! In 1989, Porsche introduced this car, the Carrera 4, so called because it has four wheel drive. Now, that enabled Porsche to go out into the big wide world and convince everyone that the 911's tricky tail had been tamed. Whether it actually had or not is a different matter, but either way, Porsche's showrooms suddenly found themselves playing host to a new breed of butterfingered customer.
Porsche made strenuous denials that they were the finest purveyors of automobiles to the yuppie classes, but behind the scenes they were bending over backwards to woo the guys in the red braces. They had the wonderful cabrio here, but perhaps more importantly was the so-called Tiptronic gearbox. Yuppie man could now charge hither and thither with a telephone permanently fastened to his right ear because this is basically a 911 with an automatic gearbox. The enthusiasts were horrified. But it was no ordinary automatic gearbox. I mean, you could use it like one, put it in D in town and just poodle around. Or on the open road, you move the lever over here and then you've got something like a bike gearbox. You pull the lever toward you, third, second, wow. And then simply move it away, second, third, fourth. You have manual control. Me though, I just leave it in D all the time and poodle around, eating cheese, taking in some rays listening to the cackle of that wonderful air-cooled six-cylinder engine. And besides, if you drive slowly, you can still hear your mobile phone ringing. The dash, though, is a mess. You really can tell the car's 30 years old from where I'm sitting. You can't see any of the dials except for the large, centrally placed rev counter, and all the knobs look like boiled sweets. The yuppies loved it. They thought it was what the serious driver wanted. They could take their Alice banded girlfriends out for a spin and pretend that they were the kind of person who'd made the 911 notorious in the first place. Unfortunately, the real enthusiasts stopped buying 911s because they didn't want people to think they were yuppies. That would have been just fine if the yuppie breed had lasted. But as the recession began to bite, city boys on the red eye took a hit and the flash cash was gone. So too was the 911's principal customer base. So they need the enthusiasts back. And now, as Tiff has been finding out, they might just have the car to do it. Interesting, all that stuff about yuppies. Mind you, spoken by an expert on the subject, Kings Road Clarkson himself. However, he does have a point. If Porsche to win back those true driving enthusiasts, they need a serious car to seriously impress. And this is it, the very latest 911 Turbo. Not my choice of colour, perhaps, but that doesn't detract from these classic 911 lines. There's the distinctive turbo hallmarks of the whale tail and those huge wheel arch extensions. New 18-inch rims house drill discs and four-pot aluminium calipers. The latest turbo uses the same 3.6-litre engine as the Carrera 2 and 4. But with 0.9 bar of boost from the turbocharger, the output is pushed up from their 250 to 360 horsepower. And that's over 10% up on the old turbo model. With the best will in the world, you can't really stretch its legs on the public roads. In such cases, we normally go to a racetrack. But for the 911, Millbrook Proving Ground in Bedfordshire seemed like a better bet. Not only can you go flat out on the banked bowl and the mile straight, there's the handling and the hill circuits to offer every type of corner and gradient to test the car's performance. Of course, the first question everyone asks is, how fast? Let's find out. The banked circuit at Millbrook is a perfect circle, two miles round. You can actually drive in the top lane at a steady 100 miles an hour with your hands off the wheel as the banking steers you around. Over 100 and you need to hang on tight and hold the car away from the barriers. At high speeds you feel every little bump as the car sits down on its suspension. The Porsche Speedo showed a flat out 175 miles an hour. 
The second question, 0 to 60. Hold on. Well, if you're prepared to burn a lot of expensive rubber and be brutal with the clutch and gearbox, it'll do it in 4.7 seconds. But really, that sort of behaviour is best left for the racetrack. Now, the third question, which people never seem to ask, is how quickly does it stop? I'll show you. We're doing 30 miles an hour. If I hit the brakes, it stops. In fact, it stopped in just 27 feet. And at 70 miles an hour, it was even more impressive. Just under 100 feet, way short of the highway code's 245. So it goes fast and stops quickly. But how does the 911 cope with the country lanes? The country lanes at Millbrook are glorious, twisting, almost alpine roads, which despite their centre-line markings are one way, so I could test the 911 in complete safety. Now, it wasn't just the four-wheel drive that improved the 911's handling, because the new Carreras also featured substantially modified chassis and suspension that made the rear-wheel drive Carrera 2 just as sure-footed as the 4. But then you ask it to cope with another 110 horsepower. No problem. Now, while the latest Carrera 4 does help save Jeremy from ending up in the ditch, you can never get away from the fact that the 911 has most of its weight in the tail. Normally, that means if you power into a corner too fast and lift off the throttle, the back swings out. It may still be true in the wet, but in the dry, I couldn't get it to go. On the other hand, break the traction with brute horsepower and you can get a glorious tail-out power slide. With my research finished for the day, I took the 911 Turbo onto the handling circuit for some exhilarating high-speed motoring. The new chassis and now the new engine have seen the Turbo evolve yet again into an even better, even safer machine that provides real driver satisfaction. Of course, if you try too hard, things can get very dramatic. It's hard work filming for Top Gear. I'd like to introduce you to the Renault A610 and the Venturi. These cars may be cheaper than the Porsche, but even though they're very nearly as much fun, they just don't sell. Now they may look completely different, but in fact, they're very similar. They're both French, they're both made out of plastic, they're both very rare, and they both use the same turbocharged Renault V6 engine. In the A610, it has three litres, and it's mounted here, behind the rear wheels. That is a Porsche trick. Now the Venturi has 2.8 litres, but the engine is mounted here, in front of the rear wheels. That makes it mid-engined, and that is a Ferrari trick. Now, obviously, neither have much in the way of luggage space. The Venturi here has enough room for one squidgy bag. That doesn't have a boot at all. The front bit is all full of fuel tank and spare wheel and gubbins like that, and the middle bit, well, there are a couple of seats there, but the only person who could have any degree of comfort in them is Anne Boleyn, in kit form. But practicality in sports cars like these doesn't really matter. What does matter is the fact that they're both indecently fast. <laughs> in a race to 60 miles an hour, there's nothing in it. Both get there in about five and a half seconds and both will top 160 miles an hour flat out. 
Given a bit of tailwind, actually, the Venturi should be able to nudge 170. Now, it may well be fleet of foot, but I rather wish it was stern of anchor too. It doesn't have anti-lock brakes. But let's face it, this kind of driving is no real relevance in the real world. For that, you need to leave Mallory Park and find a real road. Pity. Out here, the similarities come to a shuddering halt. These two cars become as different as cabbages from thermonuclear fission. The Renault is far more composed, perhaps because it's the result of years of development. The A610 may be new, but the car on which it's based, the Alpine, is as old as the hills. It's a bit of a worry having that big engine slung way out at the back where it can act like a giant pendulum, poised and ready to fling you off the road if you go around a corner too fast. But in fact, the A610 has a seemingly boundless supply of grip. In many ways, it's just like driving a fast saloon car. And that view is kind of reinforced by the interior, which I think is just a bit too normal, a bit too like any other Renault. And when you're just pootling around in town, something the A610 is very good at, incidentally, you can't help feeling that it's just another car from just another large manufacturer. What you really need to convince yourself otherwise is an open road. Once in a while, you need to press the loud pedal down just to remind you that you're in something just a little bit special. However, it's not as special as the Venturi. More composed, yes. Easier to live with, sure. But more special? No way. This car is worth the money for its innards alone, and there's no point hunting behind the facade for evidence of kit carishness, because you won't find any. This is one of the finest interiors I've ever been in. You can just tell that it wasn't the result of some corporation think tank. It's obviously been crafted by a team of enthusiasts. Now, the switches, they're all straight out of a Citroen, and there are a lot of them. But they look so right. The leather, all hand-stitched, and the last time I saw this much, I think I was in a milking parlour. And then there's the wood. It just looks so good. It's absolutely magnificent, but it is not quiet. At anything above three miles an hour, there's an incredible shriek from the turbochargers, so refinement is not a Venturi's strong point. Ah, what am I talking about? At least when the turbo's whistling, you can't hear a rather irritating squeak from the dashboard. But better than that, it even drowns out Radio 1's hideously lively breakfast show. I've already said the Renault A610 is a bit too composed to be a sports car. Well, this wailing banshee of a machine is not. It's plain good fun. They're forever prattling on in the car magazines about how a good steering system talks to a driver, letting him know exactly what the front wheels are doing. Well, this isn't talking, it's yelling at me through a megaphone. Couple that to the car's tininess, its perfect mid-engine balance, and the noisiest 260 brake horsepower this side of a bike Grand Prix, and you have one pretty spot-on supercar. Historically, supercars are a European thing. The Americans, with their predilection for cars that are still rocking back and forth 20 minutes after you've stopped, have never even attempted one. But times, they are a-changing. The capital city of Cardam, like a huge, lazy lion, is waking up and showing us that it has teeth. Big, spiky ones. They make cars in Dagenham. They make cars in Turin and Gothenburg and Paris. They even make cars in Hiroshima. But there is only one motor city. Detroit. Motown. But now it is fighting back with a car that very firmly puts Detroit back on the centre stage. 
It's so exciting, in fact, that before we show it to you, I think it's important that one or two people leave the room. In fact, I've drawn up a list. Uh, policemen, children, old people, people with weak hearts, people with weak anything. Jonathan Porritt. In fact, all environmentalists, except David Bellamy. You can stay, David, because I know you like cars. Uh, doctors, magistrates, Linfolds, Wood, caravanners and politicians. Right, now we got rid of that lot, let's have some fun. But, uh, would you just look at this? This is an open vehicle. Drive carefully. No. While the rest of America is talking about electric cars and a need to conserve fuel, Chrysler is talking about this, the Viper, a 166-mile-an-hour, 8-litre Leviathan. For those who don't want to pussyfoot around at 2 miles an hour in a solar-powered box, this is a dream come true, a throwback to the days when cobras ruled the road and performance was king. This car kicks ass. Today, most so-called sports cars are heavy and decadent, but this one is different. You could almost call it Spartan. I'm untroubled here with a roof, and the only reason there are no electric windows is because there are no windows at all. There's no cruise control, there's no electric door mirrors, but there is air conditioning. A lot of air conditioning. This no-frills approach means the whole car weighs just 3,200 pounds. Not bad when you remember it's 15 feet long. It especially isn't bad when you consider the monster that lives under the bonnet. Big, isn't it? Big, but not complicated. There are no turbochargers, there are no superchargers, there aren't even four valves per cylinder. So what is it then? Well, this is an all-aluminium 8,000cc V10 truck engine. Let me put some figures on it for you. 400 brake horsepower, 450 pounds-feet of torque, 0 to 60 in four and a half seconds, 0 to 100 and back to naught again in 14 and a half seconds. Unburdened, of course, by any door handles. You have to reach inside to open the door. Ah. Once more, into the breach. Unbelievably, at slow speeds, this automotive volcano is as quiet and as unassuming as Lincolnshire. The ride is superb. You'd expect those massive, low-profile tyres to bounce if they even so much as smelt a cat's eye. But no, you could drive through an earthquake in the Viper and it would feel as docile as an E.M. Forster novel. Mind you, if you want to turn Helena Bonham Carter into a snarling Arnold Schwarzenegger, all you need do is drop a cog on the six-speed box, mash your foot into the carpet, and then all hell breaks loose. You don't drive this car, you just hang on. It's like riding an atom bomb. I tell you, it's, uh, it makes the rocket look about as exciting as a deep freeze. Against this, the Diablo's like winning a poo. So, this car has all the sensitivity and social responsibility of a Tomcat. It's so good, I have just got to have one of these cars. Just, it's just got to. I've got to. And you're able to turn my dream into your reality because the Viper is one of the few American-made cars on sale in Britain. Right, one final word, just in case any of the sensible people have crept back into the room. Luggage space. Well, as you'd expect in a car with no windows, it's not that great. But there is room for one of these. And let's not be downhearted, let's look on the upside. Very useful for getting the bugs out your teeth. Right, I'm off now. I'm gonna go rob a bank.
So the Americans at long last have given us a supercar worth going to prison for. TVR have had a go at it too, and now even the Japanese are muscling in on the act. The Supra may well be a super car, but it's not a super car. Sure, it goes like one, and if you're far enough away, it even looks like one, but it just isn't special enough. Now, the Honda NSX, on the other hand, is special enough, but in my book, it's too easy to drive to be a super car. However, this is not my book. It's not a book at all, in fact. It's a video, and it's yours. So here goes. Talk of supercars and you think excitement and impracticality. The ultimate in performance, but nowhere to stow your golf clubs. Great style and drama, but an unwilling thoroughbred fighting to wrest control from the macho male behind the wheel. When the Japanese talk of supercars, it comes out differently. The NSX looks okay and performs brilliantly but maybe the engineers have done too good a job and designed out the character one associates with a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. Maybe it's too much like a Porsche. That's not a 911, but a 944. Driving the NSX on the open road really is a very simple task. Honda wanted the car to be easy to drive, and certainly they've succeeded in doing that. All the controls are very standard, normal controls. Gear change, clutch, braking, it's all very light indeed. The engine has very good torque, which gives it great pulling power, so the second gear will take you from naught to 90 miles an hour. In fact, it's too tall. So in some of these tight turns, you need to drop down into first if you're hoping to enjoy some sporting performance. Really, it's rather too well house-trained for the public roads. After all, any supercar finds speed limits and narrow lanes hard to take. So the empty circuit at Alton Park was a welcome release. In creating an ultimate supercar, Honda have chosen a mid-engine layout with a 3-litre V6 engine mounted right behind the driver's seat. They've actually chosen not to go the turbocharged route, but instead the engine has all the very latest in high-tech engine design. There's variable timing, variable volume induction, and a sequential port fuel injection system. All this adding up to give the driver up to 274 horsepower as a maximum to play with. At the same time, they've tried to make the car as light as possible to make the very most out of this power that's available. They've created an aluminium monocoque, aluminium body panels, and aluminium suspension. All this to keep the weight down as much as possible. Even so, this package, when compared with its major competitors, is still heavier than Porsche's 911 Carrera 2, and doesn't have as good a power-to-weight ratio as Ferrari's 348. The interior is very road car basic, it's a very simple layout and there's nothing futuristic in the instrumentation of this supercar. Space wise, well there's plenty of room for the driver and the passenger, but there's no room at all for my briefcase and no little parcel shelf for any knickknacks. Elsewhere there's precious little space also. Under the bonnet there's only room for the radiator, the anti-lock braking system and the space saver wheel, which needs to be inflated before you can use it. 
in the middle of the car, well, there's the engine, and that takes up all that space. But around at the rear, there is a small boot, just enough room for my luggage, but if I have to put the punctured wheel in, it just about squeezes in there. The racetrack is the proper place to play with all this power, but it also demonstrates the VTEC variable timing system is really wasted on the public roads. It comes in at 6,000 revs, which is 60 miles an hour in second, but a highly illegal 90 in third. Having said that, it really is a beautiful engine to drive. With a rev limit just over 8,000 revs, there is a singing power from 6,000 all the way through. The braking is very, very good indeed. That uh, four-pot, four-wheel ABS anti-locking working very well. And also the traction control system is very good indeed, only occasionally interrupting my power acceleration. Handling again, also very, very sure-footed. Mild understeer turning in, and hardly a twitch of the tail as full power is added. So really, at smooth, high-speed driving, it's almost a faultless car. Of course, on a racetrack, you can try a little harder, and for preference, I would switch off the traction control system so I could slide the tail a bit more through the slower corners. Mild understeer, and then I can put the power in, and then there's just a little wag of the tail as the rear wheel breaks its traction. Hard acceleration, third gear, 7,000. Third gear taking me to about 110 miles an hour before I need fourth gear. Back on the public roads, and straight away the supercar turns back into a saloon car. It really is a very, very easy car to drive. Everything is light, the controls easily come to hand. Now, that was one of Honda's design criteria. They wanted to make a supercar that almost anybody could just get into and drive. And in that, they've succeeded. It's as easy to drive as a Porsche's 944S2. But then it does have all the impracticalities and lack of space of Ferrari's 348. So in a way, they've got either the best or the worst of both worlds. And it really depends what you're looking for when you're trying to buy a supercar. But for many people, there is only one supercar. You knew we'd get there eventually. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Ferrari. Like pretty well every single Ferrari since 1950, this car, the 456 GT, has been designed by Pininfarina. It is staggeringly beautiful. It's the long-awaited replacement for the Daytona, a long-nosed, short-tailed, perfectly proportioned Grand Tourer that does more than cock a snook at current trends. It takes fashion and, like the Aston Martin Vantage, it throttles it. This is classical elegance. And it's the same story inside. You still get the chromed gear lever and the chrome gate, though now with seven slots. The dials are simple, white on black. The seats are leather. It's simple, uncluttered. If it was clothing, it would be a cocktail dress. A spacious one, though, because there in the back are two seats. So you put your luggage in the boot and you go for a drive. You will arrive wherever it is you're going sooner than you thought, too, because this family saloon is no slouch. It is frighteningly fast. It gets from 0 to 60 in 5.2 seconds, and the top speed is an amazing 194 miles an hour. It's the 
fastest four-seater in the world. Now, in case you're sitting there wondering about fuel economy, let me remind you that petrol is cheaper than milk. So I'll do you a deal. You don't ask me how many miles to the gallon I'm doing in my Ferrari, and I won't come round to your house in the morning asking how much milk you're putting on your cornflakes. All right? The 456 wasn't designed to save the planet. It was designed to get a family of four across continents fast, and it does that with consummate ease. But it was also designed to be stylish, and it does that even better. Think of it as a suit. Now, you can buy an off-the-peg job from someone like Mercedes, but this one has been made to measure. It's tailored. You just know it hasn't rolled down some anonymous production line somewhere. It's been handcrafted by people, people who are passionate about their motor cars, and that shows. But, of course, the central pillar to any Ferrari is its engine. And the 456 is no different. There it is, and here are some numbers. It has 12 cylinders, 48 valves, four camshafts. It develops 442 brake horsepower. That's four times more than the dear old Ferrari 125C. It's four times more than your Golf GTI. But it's 100 horsepower less than the Aston Martin Vantage. However, before you all start waving Union Jacks out of the window, I have to tell you that this Italian thoroughbred weighs rather a lot less than the British Shire Horse. As a result, it feels more nimble, less like a chest of drawers with a jet engine strapped to the roof and more like a Lipizzana. Through the corners, the 456 is in a class of its own. OK, the Aston does well, despite its girth. But with the Ferrari, there's no need for butts. Its responses are sharp and faster than a lightning bolt. You can arrive at a bend with huge speed, use the huge four-pot brakes to wash it off, and then entrust the turn to nearly 50 years of cornering know-how before burying the throttle again. It doesn't take very long before you're hurling it into corners with the carefree abandon of someone who's just been granted eternal life. I just love this car. However, don't get confused. It may have an old-fashioned layout with the engine at the front and the gearbox at the back in line with the driven wheels, but make no mistake, the 456 is in tune with the times. As far as toys are concerned, you get electric windows, electric seats, air conditioning, and uh, that's it. But that's all you need, because this is not some namby-pamby posing pouch. It's a driver's car. It's like espresso coffee. It's small, tight, and effective. Nothing like cappuccino, all froth and no substance. I really love this car. A lot of people have got it into their heads that the 456 is my favourite supercar. Afraid not. This is the Aston Martin Vantage. Yes, it has a boot. Yes, it has four seats. But be in no doubt, it is a supercar. Dust down your Elgar, run up your Union Jacks, because as far as I'm concerned, the best is British. This is an old-fashioned car factory. You won't find line workers in here. It's more like a cottage industry where everybody 
is a craftsman. Or craftswoman. But there is nothing remotely cottagey about its latest creation. of a Chippendale and the stance of a street fighter, this looks like a supercar of the old school. It's the leather-lined, airbagged, catalytically sound supercoupe they call the Vantage. When I dropped by asking for a test drive, they said that this one was on its way to a motor show, and the answer was no. However, they did agree, after a bit of persuasion, to lend us this one. It is their engineering prototype, so the fit and finish isn't what you'd call regal. Also, the rear lights are wrong, the wheels are wrong, there isn't even a back seat. But, most important of all, mechanically, it's spot on. I have been looking forward to this for months, and I'm not going to let a wonky paint finish spoil things. Steering is just excellent, but it rolls and wallows where a Ferrari would point and squirt. You won't find the most opulent interior this side of Balmoral in a Ferrari either. This is what makes the Vantage so special. It's a Rolls Royce with attitude. any number of reasons for liking this car, but the main one is under the bonnet. You want to know what a proper engine looks like? That is a hand-built 5.3-litre V8, which, for that little extra something, has two superchargers, which are so big you could go on holiday in them. It develops 550 brake horsepower, and perhaps more importantly, 550 pounds feet of torque. You are looking, ladies and gentlemen, at the most powerful production car in the world. However, because it weighs more than two tons, it is not the fastest car in the world. It's not far off, though. is the Santa Pod Raceway, which in its time has seen some fair old duels. Today, though, it's playing host to one of the most ferocious shootouts of all time. This is what happens when you pit a Vantage against a Diablo. Both get 
get from 0 to 60 in about four and a half seconds. Only when you're out past 150 miles an hour will the Diablo's superior aerodynamics start to pay off. It peaks at 204 miles an hour. The Aston's out of steam at 185. But remember, in the Aston, your family can come too. This is about as good as cars get. OK, I know, it chews fuel like a power station. It's just about impossible to insure. But car enthusiasts everywhere should get on their knees and thank God that someone somewhere still has the guts to make a car like this. Sadly, very few people will ever get to drive any of these cars, but now at least you can watch this tape over and over again and dream pleasant dreams. Mm -hmm.